we're taking this opportunity to look back on a year that I think has been uh, pretty impressive for the UK-Rwanda partnership. Um, and it's a relationship that has been very strong for a number of years. Um, but I think this year has uh, really taken it to another level. And I was just thinking about, you know, the number of senior British figures that have been here this year, and it's a really long list. Um, I mean, if we start with now their majesties, the king and the queen consort, we've had a prime minister here, we've had three cabinet members, we've had three ministers of state, we've had about a dozen different members of parliament from both our houses of parliament, um, as well as the Countess of Wessex and the Duke of Sussex, uh, and a host of other visitors that have been through this year. And I think the reason there's so much interest is because this is a country that is ambitious about what it's doing domestically for its own development, and a country that's ambitious about what it can do on the world stage in terms of helping to contribute towards tackling global challenges. And we as the UK are very happy to work with Rwanda on both those, uh, those strands. So I would just highlight, I know you've uh, had some detail on it, but that there are three areas I think that have made us particularly close and closer this year. The first one, of course, was Chogum itself, um, an event that was uh, you know, a really great event, very well organized and handled here in, in Rwanda. But it was the coming together, not just obviously of the UK and Rwanda, but of the entire Commonwealth family to talk about how we strengthen our relationships, our trade, our shared values. Uh, and the fact that we as the UK were handing over chair and office to Rwanda uh, has brought the relationship very closely together. And we're now looking at which other areas we can work together in the Commonwealth space uh, during the period of Rwanda's chair in office. The second thing that uh, this year has made us uh, come together very closely is the Migration and Economic Development Partnership signed by our two countries earlier this year. And that, as you probably know, is a partnership that is designed to stop people making dangerous crossings uh, across the channel in, in to the UK we're putting their lives at risk. And it's also to stop the business model of criminal gangs who are currently uh, exploiting these very vulnerable and desperate people for their, for their own gain. Um, that partnership is one that we are very strongly committed to and uh, Prime Minister Sunak just yesterday said uh, once again that once the current court case in the UK is complete, which we hope will be on Monday, uh, we are much looking forward to getting on and implementing that deal. Then the third of these areas that I'd say has been particularly important this year would be on climate change. Um, if you go back to the end of last year when the UK hosted uh, COP26 in Glasgow, I would say that Rwanda and the UK were two of the closest partners there, and we have continued that through the year, hosting various high-level events together, whether at Chogham, at the UN General Assembly, or even in Sharm el-Sheikh at the COP27. Um, and we also, at COP27, announced uh, 7 million of extra funding to go into Rwanda's new green investment facility, the Arembe uh, Invest, which President Kagame announced in Sharm el-Sheikh. And I think that's a really great... Um, model that others will look to emulate because it's trying to drive up private sector investment into, into green spaces here, uh, which I think is really positive. Um, and we also had this year the opening of the uh, Africa Center of Excellence on Sustainable Cooling in Kigali, which is a really important partnership between the UK and Rwanda and some others like the UN, uh, which is looking to develop the technologies and new ideas that will really allow not just Rwanda, but the whole continent to benefit from new cooling technologies that don't damage the, the environment. So these are the three areas that I think have particularly made uh, this year sort of uh, even more, uh, more close between the two countries. But of course, there is a lot that goes on normally that uh, are continuations of development partnerships that we have. Uh, and the reason that we have such an extensive partnership with Rwanda on, on the development side is that we feel we see very good results from the partnership that we have with the government of Rwanda. Uh, we work particularly closely in areas like education and social protection, but we also have kind of capacity building technical partnerships that work with the Rwanda Revenue Authority, with the National Institute for Statistics in Rwanda, and those are helping build the capacity and good governance uh, of the country here. And then the other area that we also continue to work on and have done uh, for some time is our work with civil society organizations. 
uh, we think it's uh, civil society has a really important part to play in the continued development uh, of the country. And so we have supported disabled people's groups uh, to allow them to be more engaged in, in society and in their work. We have supported uh, LGBT organizations to help uh, support that community. Um, but we also do work that is looking at uh, helping implement the UPR recommendations on, on human rights and to help strengthen the freedom of the media and the media policy environment uh, in Rwanda. And we're, we're really proud uh, of all that work. Um, and then the final area perhaps that I would just touch on before I come on to your questions is also around trade. Um, we have had traditionally a relatively small uh, trade relationship between Rwanda and the United Kingdom, but it's now around, worth around £36 million each year, and that's an increase uh, of 6% in 2021, and we see it continually going uh, in that direction. Uh, the UK is already a big source, uh, a big importer of Rwandan tea, coffee, and horticulture. But we're also seeing increased interest in investment in other areas, whether the water sector, in tourism, uh, and some of our government uh, investment agencies are increasingly looking at what they can do here uh, in Rwanda. And next year, we will be um, bringing to life the Developing Countries Trading Scheme, which the Prime Minister announced actually while he was here, the former Prime Minister during Chogham. Uh, and that will allow for Rwanda and uh, a number of other developing countries to have easier and simpler tariff-free access to the UK market. So again, I hope that that will help us see an increase uh, in trade between our two countries uh, as a really uh, important part of this, this relationship. Um, so I think I will uh, leave it there as sort of the highlights of some of the things that we've worked on this year. Um, but I'm very happy to go into more detail about any of those or to take questions about specific areas of that that you would like to talk about. Thank you, Your Excellency. My name is Edmund Kajira. I work for KT Press. Uh, you mentioned, you talked about the Rwanda-UK partnership. As the year comes to an end, it appears um, this partnership may not materialize. Uh, just if you could shed more light on uh, the future of that partnership. Does it look like something that will happen at some point. You have hoped to happen at some point. Also, if you could weigh in a bit on the regional issues, um, the UK has not talked much about the situation in, in Eastern DRC. I'd like to hear from you where do you stand on what is going on. Yeah, so first to tackle the Migration and Economic Development Partnership that, uh, that you asked about. So that was signed earlier this year, and we have worked with the government of Rwanda to put in place all the framework to allow it to be successful and to get off the ground. That included a transfer of a significant amount of the development funding to the government of Rwanda, and that is to help both those who might be relocated here in the future and to help uh, build economic opportunities for host, com for host communities and, and people here in Rwanda. So that has all already happened. So the deal is starting to, to work in that way. It hasn't yet uh, started in terms of people being transferred here from the UK. And that is because there is an ongoing legal case uh, in the UK where the government of the United Kingdom was challenged on, on this policy. The UK government is very confident that this uh, agreement is, is legal and correct and has fought that case in court. We expect the verdict to come on Monday. So once we have that verdict, if it is in favor of the UK government, then we will be able to move towards implementation of this agreement with people being transferred here. And that's what the Prime Minister said yesterday in his speech on illegal migration, that he's still very much committed to seeing that happen. Uh, I can't yet predict fully uh, what the timelines of that might be until we hear the verdict next Monday. But both sides are still very much committed to it and believe that it will help achieve what we want it to achieve. Um, on the Eastern DRC, I would just challenge that the UK hasn't spoken about it. There's been uh, quite a few uh, statements. If you look on uh, Twitter, for example, our ministers Andrew Mitchell and Lord Ahmed have both uh, made comments about the situation there recently. Most specifically, last week or the week before, Lord Ahmed uh, talked about a recent uh, attack in Kisheshi, which uh, seems to have led to the killing and uh, rape of a number of individuals uh, in Eastern Congo, which is extremely distressing. Uh, I think what we are very clear about is that the humanitarian suffering has to stop. 
Uh, and for that to stop, all sides need to implement what has been agreed in places like Luanda and in the Nairobi process. And the things that have been agreed which we think must be implemented are uh, first, that the fighting has to stop. All armed groups need to, to stop fighting and respect the ceasefire. That also includes the uh, FARDC uh, forces. Um, there should be no support to um, illegal armed groups. And there should be withdrawal, as has been agreed. So some organizations, such as the M23, who themselves have publicly said that they will both cease fire and withdraw, those things need to be implemented. We are not yet seeing that implementation, and so we are clear that it needs to happen. Um, but we're also clear that there needs to be more action from the government of the DRC to tackle hate speech in the region, which I know is very concerning to many communities there. And it also has to tackle any collaboration between its uh, armed forces and armed groups such as the FDLR. But there really will not be a military solution to this. So our strong uh, opinion is that this needs to be a political process, both between the countries of the region, but importantly between the government in Kinshasa and the various rebel groups uh, that exist in its territory. And the Nairobi process is designed to deliver that. So we're very grateful to the government of Kenya, particularly for its leadership on this uh, issue and to the entire East African community for helping to facilitate these talks. But we really need to see uh, all sides deliver on their commitments. And then we will also hope to see the East African force that uh, has been agreed come onto the ground to then provide the sort of buffer and protection for civilians to stop the fighting. But really this has to be a political process and that's what we're pressing for.